You know, Father, there's no one else that could take a grave and turn it into a garden. There's no one else that could take and see His chosen ones with their back to a water of wall, a wall of water, and You turn it into a highway. Father, may we never underestimate who You are. God, may we always give You the glory for who You are and not for what You do for us. And God, You take now. And God, You let Your precious Word become a part of us. God, You let it be a wellspring of water coming up out of us. That God, we look forward to doing Your will and doing Your service. God, you take your word this morning. You make it precious. You make us desire it. And we ask this in your holy and precious son's name. And the church said, amen Amen and amen. You know, when I was in high school, I weighed a whole thing of about 175 pounds. I never did get into wrestling. But I, I watched these guys wrestle each other. But I have wrestled with God. Amen. Have any of y'all ever done that? And you know, it didn't take me long to figure out the more I wrestled, the more I figured out I didn't know what I was doing. This morning we're going to look at a story of a man who wrestled with God. But I want to give you a little background first, and most of you probably know all this, but the story here pertains to Jacob. And if you go and look up what Jacob's name means, it means deceiver. And if you are familiar with his story, you know why that probably is. As him and his brother Esau, Jacob was his mother's pick. Esau was a guy who was kind of hairy and outdoorsy and liked to go a hunt game and stuff and and Jacob was more of a stay-home-with-mama kind of guy. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm just setting the stage here. So as Isaac, their father, got well up on in the years, over in Genesis, some of the earlier chapters from where we're going to be this morning, he was telling Esau, said, I want you to go out and kill some game and bring it back in and fix me up a a tasty bowl of this and bring it in to me, then I'm going to bless you. Now, let's understand something this morning. The oldest son, who was Esau, looked forward to their father's blessing because that set the rest of their life. That set the stage for who they were. And so Esau went out and gathered up his influence to go hunting and He went to hunt. Well, Mama had overheard the conversation. So she thought, I want Jacob to have the blessing. So she sent Jacob out to kill a goat and brought it in and she prepared up a bowl of stuff. And and then Jacob said, well now Mama, you know that if Daddy fills me on my arms or anything, my hair's not like Esau's. And he's going to know something's up. Well, Mama had done figured it all out. She takes and puts some things of goat's hair on his arms and on the back of his neck. And then she sends him in. Now Jacob, carrying out his name as deceiver here, goes in and, and tells his father, said, I'm Esau, I'm back with you, something to eat. And, well, why, how did you do this so quick? Well, God showed me favor and, and I was able to kill this animal. He's lying the whole time he's in there. 
And so anyway, long story short, after Isaac partakes of the bowl of food that he brought in, he gives him a blessing. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But this set the stage for who Jacob was, not so much in the blessing that he received, but in the deceiving he did to get it. You see, sometimes we deceive ourselves when God wants us to do something. Have you ever been there? See, I'll say, well, you know, God, you know, I'm, I'm not capable of doing that, all along knowing that whatever God's going to put me to, He's going to prepare me for. But I want to find excuses. What if the church today relied more on excuses than they did on doing what God wanted them to do? Think about that. We would not only be sitting still, we would be backing up. I went to the Presbyter's meeting Tuesday down in Montgomery and found out that over half of the AG churches are declining. Now you can blame it on the COVID, you can blame it on whatever you want to. But we have a generation coming up now where 30-something percent has no affiliation with God. More so, why it's so important for the church to pour into its young children, its teenagers, and young adults, and prepare them for what is coming in their life. You see adults today that are going back to, reverting back to their teenage years because they didn't get to be a teenager and because they weren't prepared to go out into the world. And the world will eat you up. So don't deceive yourself this morning. Don't deceive yourself in thinking we as a church cannot do anything. We as a church are not capable. Well, there may be some truth in that because sometimes we see a lot of churches that are not God-centered, so therefore they're not going to be capable. But here at Good News, we're going to be God-centered and we're going to be capable. Amen. Amen. I want you to remember this in about a month. But here was Jacob had done deceived his father, took his brother's birthright, and now was fixing to have to get out of the house. So mama's done all figuring that he don't need to be marrying certain kinds of young ladies. So she's going to talk with Esau and get him sent off to her brothers, Laban. So that's another whole story there, but whenever you get into this and look, everything in Jacob's life seemed like depended on a lie or on some type of deceivement wherever he went. Then he got some payback from his father-in-law. And I'm not going to get into that this morning. But as we look at the main scripture this morning here in Genesis 32, verses 22 through 32, let's see what it says. It says, That night Jacob got up. Now this is right before he's going to meet his brother Esau for the first time since he's been gone from home. And took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabrook. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but 
Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Penel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Penel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Why was this so important that as he wrestled with God, he wanted a blessing? Well, if you go back over to chapter 28 and look at verses 3 and 4, this may enlighten us a little bit. Genesis 28, 3 and 4. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May He give you and your descendants the blessings given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now reside as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. Now this was the blessing that God had and this was the blessing that Jacob wanted and this is why as he was wrestling with this man who was, was, uh, was more than likely as, as uh, the scripture doesn't bring out but as he wrestled with this man it was probably the angel of the Lord that God had sent there to wrestle with Jacob and Jacob prevailed not because he was mightier but because God allowed that to happen. And as God allowed that to happen and it got daybreak, Jacob said, I want my blessing. Because Jacob thought, if I can just hang on, if I can just outlast him, I'm going to get the blessing. The ultimate blessing that God has promised my people. And so he took care, and even though his name was that of a crafty deceiver, you know, when something happens in your life and God gets hold of you, you change. You change. And so God wanted him to know that he had to change, and so he took and he renamed him Israel, which means he struggles with God. Now, as I thought about that, before it didn't seem like Jacob had any problem being a deceiver. But, <clears throat> but now, as God has touched him, I think every time he moved and he had a limp, he remembered how he got that limp, and he also remembered that I struggle with God and my name is now changed. I'm no longer a deceiver, but I am an inheritor of God. I have inherited a blessing that God has given me, and I am going to change. <coughs> and I think when this happened... He became dependent, dependent upon God. And I'm just wondering how dependent he'd been upon God before this. I think before he was under his own devices to get what he wanted. Even though he did receive blessings while he was living with his father-in-law uh, with, the, with the raising of the herds and all that happened, and that's a whole other story. But I don't think he ever came to the place where he is totally dependent on God till he got to this place <coughs> and let me tell you he was in a situation to where he was fixing to go out and meet Esau and I think that he was looking to lose his life because the way he had deceived his brother and what he had taken away from him his birthright if you go back over and read when Esau went in and said father just give me some type of blessing I don't know if I'd wanted the blessing that Esau got. You can go back and read about it. But I think he was thinking, Esau is now fixing to get his revenge as I meet him. That's the reason he had sent all the rest of them on over to get them separated from him so that Esau would not kill his whole family. 
And as he had wrestled with God here, and God had brought him to a place to where he is now a struggler with God, God does not want his people to be passive. We can sit back and we can wait. I don't believe God wants us sitting back. I believe God wants us moving on forward in a direction to where we see our children trained, our young adults trained, our teenagers trained, our adults trained, to where we can meet what's coming in the days to come. And that is the end time. I think we're fixing to see a revival. And let me tell you something, unless the church is prepared, it's not going to be able to meet the needs of a revival. And let, let, me, let me just say this. When we look today, compared to what Jacob was looking for, Jacob was looking for the blessings of that God had for him in material things. Today, the church looks for blessings in the spiritual things. God's going to take care of us in the material things. We'll get into that just a little bit later, but when we talk about victory. But the church needs to be concerned about the spiritual awareness and the spiritual conduct and the spiritual uh, fullness of the church. If we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us, we're missing the mark. We're missing where God has given us direction because it's only by the direction of the Holy Spirit, not by man, that the church will succeed and carry out God's plan. Oh me or oh my. And I'm seeing so many churches today after hearing the report Tuesday and seeing, and by the way, Brother Ken sends his regards to everyone and he asked me, he said, how are things going? I said, well, brother, I said, we averaged 68 last, last year for Sunday. He said, praise God. So he said, well, you know, that's not a huge number. I'm thankful for everyone. Because I believe everyone is a voice that God will use somewhere in the community to carry out His Word. Then, we see over in Zechariah 4, 6, it says this. So He said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zebriel, Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Now, through this message was spoken, it still applies to all believers today. It's not by military might, political power, or human strength. Nothing can be accomplished in God's work by any of this, but only through the power of the Holy Spirit. Only through the power that God gives us by His Spirit can we work and accomplish the things that God has in store for us. Not by our might. Have you ever... I'm kind of a fan of the old westerns. And you always see this guy on there that says, look at here what I built. Look at this ranch with 200 acres. Look at all these cattle. <laughs> and I used to say, God owns all the cattle the hills and all the acres in the ground. See, we don't possess It's all And anything that's accomplished is not by our mind, but by His. So then comes the victory. 
in Luke 11, 9 and 10, says this. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, if you'll allow me, I want to add just a little bit here. All of this is done in God's will. All of this is done in God's will. Go back to verse 9, Noah. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. But it's through the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the leading of the Holy Spirit that you know what to seek, you know where to knock, and you know which door is supposed to be open. See, anybody can go up there and kick a door down. This is what God wants. Bam. It doesn't always work. But it is a blessing when God takes through the Holy Spirit and when we go through the door, everything else just becomes clear. And no. I've also been the one that's been stubborn before and try to go through the wrong door. And it don't take long to figure out that I done messed up. And I think in our wrestles with God, we have to remember that we also have to confess our sins and ask forgiveness. In Luke eleven four, 4, it says this. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Now, as we're looking at that, we not only ask forgiveness, but we also forgive. How can to God to forgive us and uh, then we do not forgive someone else. Understand? It's a two-sided coin. We have to realize that our heart has to be with forgiveness. Thank you, brother has to be with forgiveness because let me tell you something it comes to a place to where we really can't understand the fullness of forgiveness until we've applied that and done it to someone else when someone has really really messed with you when somebody has crossed the line. But when we get it in our hearts that we can take and forgive that person. I seen a while back there was someone had been murdered. And whenever they came to the, sense, uh, the sentencing stage of the trial. I think it was the mother got up with the father one. And told the judge of the one who'd been murdered, says, I forgive them for what they've done. That has to be a deep down God love right there. And I think then we understand the forgiveness that God has when we reach that stage. In Luke eleven two. It says this. He said to them, this is Jesus speaking, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name and your kingdom come. We have to live in a place to where we get thirsty. We have to get in a place to where we desire the things of God. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I, I've been... When I was in football practice and we was running these wind sprints and these other things, your mouth would get dry. And you just want to go over and get you a drink of Gatorade or whatever that stuff was they mixed up. And I'm not sure some days exactly what it was. We called it the green slime back in our day. But you were just wanting it, desiring it. 
And when the coach said you could go get it, you broke out and run to get over there before it all got gone. That's the way we should be about the things of God. We should have such a desire and a thirst for the things of God that we cannot get through the day without getting into His Word and allowing His Spirit to become a part of us and letting it make our day and guide our day into what it's supposed to be. Because when you have a day without it, you realize how bad it is. I got up this morning, and it's just like the Spirit of God says, get ready for today. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be a day in my house today. Not because of me preaching, but because God's Word has something to instill in us. God's praising to God has something to instill in us. Then we have to pursue a life of true faith. In Matthew 6, 30 through 33, 32, excuse me, it says this. Now think about this as I'm saying it. A true life of faith. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into a fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Leave that last one up, Noah. Seek first. You know, all through Scripture, God wants the first. That's why to pass over the firstborn was so important. The first of the crop was so important when they would bring the grain in and do the wave offering before God there in the temple. But seek first His kingdom. If we get churches today seeking the kingdom of God and putting aside everything else, we're going to see a move. We're going to see things happening. And then you put His righteousness into the mix. Because see, when His righteousness is there, all we can do is what God asked of us to do. Then it says all these other things will be given to you as well. Have you ever noticed when your priorities were it's supposed to be, how things fall together? Or, or is this just me seeing this? Have you ever noticed when, when, when you... Sorry, I get away from the mic. I'm just used to moving. Have you ever noticed that when you're in the will of God and you're doing exactly what God's supposed to be doing, how things just happen in order? I always get a little tickled when somebody comes to me and they says, you know, this happened, and then this happened, and this happened, and this happened. And sometimes we don't realize it as we're on the journey, but when we get to step back and look at what is going on, I'm sorry. If we step back and look at what's going on, then God allows us to see the journey to where we're going or where we've been and where we're at. Because... Sometimes it would probably scare us to death if we knew what was coming. But if we seek first His kingdom, and you say, what has all this got to do with wrestling with God? It took Jacob wrestling before he could receive the blessing he was supposed to get. He had to wrestle with the fact that he was a deceiver, that he was not doing God's will, 
He was doing what mama told him to do and all these other things. But when he got to the point where he knew he had to do what God wanted and came dependent upon him, then it changed. Israel, a struggler with God. I've been there for the struggle. I'd rather be there doing what God wants you to do. Let me say something to you. I believe good news is positioned into a place right now that it's fixing to be used. You say, well, what are we doing? Well, last Friday, you went to Jacksonville High School. Do you know that? Brother George and Sister Kathy delivered breakfast to the teachers. You were in that church. I mean, that school. As a church. Showing these people that we love them. I want to thank Brother George for setting that up. Last year we did Alexander. This year we did Jacksonville. I don't know what we're going to do next year yet. But the church cannot be the church sitting inside the walls here. It's got to go out. It's got to reach out. And we've got to change our attitude and start doing what God has set forth for us to do. I don't believe we can be passive in doing this. I believe we have to be persistent and have to listen to what God says. I believe we have to move forward and quit being complacent with setting still. And you know what? The first thing, the next thing that happens after a church gets complacent, it starts declining. Mm -hmm. and now people are going back saying well you know it's COVID it's this and it's that I know the few times I go out to Walmart or somewhere like that it don't seem like it's hurt any of those places oh me or oh my and you know my favorite terminology is we are facing a world now with a bunch of pajama Christians they have gotten used to sitting in front of the TV watching church. But the word says, fail not or forsake not to assemble yourselves together. Get ready, some things are fixing to start happening. I'm praying that God gives us all the same vision that we can move forward. And as we do this, if we have to struggle within ourselves to find where we are with God, so be it, let us struggle and find it, then move forward. So this morning, what I would like to ask you is, have you committed to God what He wants you to do? See, it's interesting how God works. I started praying a good while back about someone to teach a discipleship class. I don't think I said a word about it from this pulpit when I was praying about this. And then one morning, Miss Beth walks up. She said, would you like to have a discipleship class? I'd like to teach it. I don't have to ask myself, is God in that when it happens? Because God orchestrated. That's just one instance. See, when we give it all to God and seek first His kingdom, then everything else will come about. Because you know what? When those in there with those youth start teaching them about the God's kingdom, the next thing you know, they're bringing somebody else that's learning. Then they're bringing somebody else that's learning. Then they're going to have to have a bigger space to learn in. When those kids, Christy came to me this morning, she said, we want to set a goal of $500 for BGMC. Do you think the church would match it? I said, tell you what, you tell them to raise $600, we're going to give them a pizza party and ice cream or something to go with it. And the church will match it. 
What is that teaching those kids? Give to God first. Life for the lost this year through the youth raised over a million dollars in the state of Alabama. BGMC, I think, was around 600 something thousand. Just about every department, the missions department, had a record year for raising funds. And it's not about the money, it's about the obedience of carrying through and seeing and teaching our children, our youth, and the young adults what they're supposed to be doing. Because they're not going to get it outside these walls. The world's not going to teach them. And you know what? They're not going to be struggling with God. They're going to be struggling with the world. So I challenge you this morning. Let's stretch ourselves. Let's become a church that's uncomfortable with standing still. Let's look at where we can expand under God's leadership in the direction He wants us to go and accomplish the things that He wants us to accomplish. A church that reaches out, that touches. And don't think I'm getting on to you this morning. You're doing a great job at it. But I don't think we ever should get complacent with what we're doing. We should strive to do more. So I'm not griping to you. I'm complimenting you and saying, let's do more. But it's going to take a commitment for us to do it. It can't just be a few. So I want to ask you this morning as Michael plays, if you'd like to come to these officers this morning and just say, God, I'm here. God, I'll do whatever you lead me in to do. But I want you to seek God's kingdom first. Then everything else will be added unto you. And let's not forget that. That's first. An Acts 2 church doing what God originally started for the church to do. As you stand this morning, if there's any other reason you'd like to come to be prayed for this morning, to be anointed with oil, to be prayed for, to receive a touch from God, or just come spend time with Him, whatever it may be. Maybe you'd like to come down and thank God for the blessings you received this week because they have been abundant in all of our lives. If you would, please come.
I want you to visualize the perfect meal. Whatever that is for you, not anybody else. See, my perfect meal is cube steak, mashed potatoes, home fried okra, and a hot biscuit and gravy. And then a piece of chocolate cake. Now, as you're visualizing that as the perfect meal, I want you to think about what it takes to get the perfect movement of God in your life. See, you just visualized and thought about that meal and how enjoyable it was. Now I want you to visualize how enjoyable it is to do what God wants for you to do. And look forward to it. Just like when Mama says, you're going to have this tonight. I want you to look forward to it. God says, you're going to have this today. As you go out. As you're my witness. And you do what I want you to do. Because only through God and being obedient to Him can we receive that. Father, we thank You. God, I thank You for good news assembly of God. God, I thank You for each person You've placed here. God, I thank You for their willingness to do Your will. Their willingness to do Your work. And God, they're not afraid to lay their hand to the plow, God. And we're not going to look back. That God, in the days to come, you're going to use this church in a mighty way, God. We want to be a part of the revival that's going to happen, God. We want to be the ones out in the forefront, God. Not because it's us, because it's you. And God, may we never fail to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise for all that's done. Go with us, go before us, and prepare the way. And God, we ask all this in your holy and precious Son's name. And the church said, Amen and Amen. Thank you.